it's only fair for every mention of Calvino, for every mention of Yona of the Dawn, you allow one art book, I think. Welcome to Keep It Fictional, a weekly podcast for book lovers by book lovers. Build your to-be-read list with Sadie, Liz, Virginia, Fiona, and Corrine from the Port Moody Public Library. Warning, this podcast contains strong opinions and may cause an increase in your library holds list. All right, welcome back to another episode of Keep It Fictional. Today, we are going to continue our most anticipated reads for this season. So last week, we have talked about a bunch of books that we're excited to read. And this week, we're going to tell you more of them. But first... I would love to know from my book friends, we're recording on April 12th, so there's been like four months and a bit. What book has been your favorite so far? What is the book that you have read that so far? And it doesn't have to be a book that is published this year. It could be a book that is published any year. So what is your favorite book so far? And I'm quickly checking all your Goodreads, your spreadsheets. I think mine is actually torn. So I have two that I really enjoyed. One I read right at the very beginning of the year, and I'm not going to say too much about it because it might come back in one of our later episodes. And this is The Book That Wouldn't Burn by Mark Lawrence. This one was on one of my most anticipated from, I'm not going to remember when it came out, sometime last year. And so, yeah, so it will be uh, coming back up. But yeah, it's a fantasy kind of set in sort of an alternate world in a library. And it's, yeah, it's very involved. It's much more than I expected it to be. And I, I loved it. I listened to the audiobook of it and I was really, really drawn in uh, the whole time. And the f- sequel is coming out, maybe even out right now. It may have just come out. So I'm excited to read that. And then the other one was actually the one that I read for Emma's Obsession episode. And that was Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan. And another fantasy uh, based on Chinese mythology. And another one where I am definitely going to uh, read the second one. It's a duology and I'm going to um, whenever I have time, I'm going to read uh, the second one of that. So, yeah, those ones I think would be my two picks for this year so far. Yeah, if we're cheating, then I'm going to cheat too. Denison Avenue for CBC Canada Reads. I'm still very bitter that it didn't win and I have thoughts. And then the other one that I really enjoyed, but I'm not allowed to talk about on the podcast about art anymore, was Provenance, How a Conman and a Forger Rewrote the History of Modern Art by Lainey Salisbury and Ali Sujo which talks about the history of John Drew, who was kind of like the the front man, the con man who sold all these paintings, and then his forger, John Myatt. And it is a wild story. If you enjoy true crime, if you, like me, love art crime, it is an amazing story. And, and, And it seems so unbelievable as you're reading it. You're like, surely not surely at some point no no one's no one's going to okay okay they're just going to keep going for years and years and years it's a really well well placed well written true crime book um that reads like a thriller and i thought it was it was really exceptional and it's it's a story that that i knew about and then just loved all the little details that the authors brought to it it's only fair for every mention of calvino for every mention of yona of the dawn you allow one art book i think Right? Like, it's only fair. So I'm going to start keeping track of that. I'm going to like, yeah. I'll try to stop talking about Yona. I just can't. (laughs) It's so good. My, obviously, like, I love reading kids graphic novels. So there's been quite a few kids comics that I've read this year that I've really loved. All of which happened to be by Kay O'Neill, because I really enjoyed The Tea Dragon Society, and I really loved The Moth Keeper. Another really kind of cute, cozy graphic novel. But my favorite book that I've read this year thus far, and similar to Kareen, did not win the Canada Reads debate, but did win the Canada Reads of my heart, um, <laughs> was Bad Cree. I just loved it. I ate it up. I loved it so much. I'm also really enjoying the book that I'm reading for next week's Keep It Fictional. So if you ask me this question next week, my answer might be different, but I don't want to spoil what that is yet. So I'm going to go with Bad Cree. Exciting. I looked at my spreadsheet and it's got quite a few four and a half, half stars. Yes, because they half stars exist in my spreadsheet also. Just in case you haven't rolled your eyes enough, Corinne, today. 
But the five star book, there are three of them. I cannot count the Spectre because every the Spectre book is a five star book. So I'm not going to count the Spectre book, but I think I'm going to probably pick, and one of them, same thing, one of them is coming up on an episode. So I'm going to save that one. The other one is going to be the one that I already talked about on the show, You Bleeding Childhood by Michele Mari, translated by Brian Robert Moore. I just love that book so much. It's always nice to discover new authors that you haven't read and you're like, they are so good. Like, And I felt like there was just a breath of fresh air when I read it, very much like when I read Calvino books. So, you know, just gives me so much joy and I just have to, yeah, you marked it down just for you. And I'm just still thinking about all those short stories. I just love them. So I think that would be my, my pick for now, you know, like my favorite book so far. So, well, thank you everyone for sharing that. We are going to talk about books that it may become our favorite book for the year. So shall we start with Emma? Let's start with Emma today. I can go first. So this next book was highly, highly recommended to me by a close friend of mine who loved the author's first book that came out, I think in 2022, 2021 or 2022. So I'm really excited to check out her second one that comes out this upcoming summer. It comes out in June. This book is actually by another local author. We joked that I'm the only one representing Canadian authors today, and apparently that's true. So this one is written by a teacher and a librarian who's currently living in Vancouver. And I actually know this author because we were at UBC in library school together. I did not know she was an author at the time until my friend told me. But alas, very exciting. This is an author who's currently getting an MLIS at UBC. So this book is called Cicada Summer, and it's the second novel by author Erica McKean. Penguin Random House's website describes it as an incantatory, incantatory and atmospheric. Cicada Summer is a dazzlingly original novel about how we grieve and care for one another. Taking place in a lakeside cabin in remote Ontario, Husha and her ailing grandfather, Arthur, are quarantining in the summer of 2020, with a heat wave bearing down and the songs of periodical cicadas surrounding them. In addition to coping with the global pandemic, they are also mourning the recent death of Husha's mother. They're soon joined by Husha's ex-lover, Nellie, who arrives at the cabin without explanation and completes their trio. Also among them in the wilderness is a strange book that Husha discovers while cleaning out her mother's home. When the three read the book, they discover that Husha's mother's last missive was a short story collection, crawling with unsettling imagery and terrifying transformations. And with the cicadas surrounding them, I can just like feel the creepiness permeating through it. As the stories from the collection start to bleed into their claustrophobic life within this cabin, Husha and Arthur and Nellie must reckon with loss, with grief and longing, and what it really means to know one another. I'm personally not too keen on bugs, so I'm like, I'm wondering how much the cicadas really are going to play a part in the plot of the story, because bugs kind of freak me out. But I do love things that are kind of spooky, a little bit like, like Virginia said before, spooky, surreal, absurd. I love things like that. So I'm not usually creeped out by like horror imagery. It's just, I don't know how the bugs are going to go. So <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that plays out for me. So long as they're not spiders, I should be okay. But I do typically really enjoy bugs books that are about grief and about family. And I like things that are a little unsettling. So I think I could handle the cicadas kind of depending on how yeah. <laughs> how creepy crawly they are. So McKean's first book, I don't know if it's called Tear or Tear, but it's T-E-A-R, is another surreal and claustrophobic story about womanhood and isolation and is filled with its own full bit of unsettling imagery. So I feel like this book will be kind of similar in theme. If you've read her first book and you really enjoyed that, like my friend did, then you might want to check this one out. Or if you like books that are kind of surreal and unnerving, books that are eerie and ethereal, and you like contemporary novels that are about grief and womanhood and family experiences, all kind of topics that I'm drawn to in my reading, then you should check out Cicada Summer by Erica McKean, which comes out this upcoming June. And I think we will pass it over to Kareen to hear what Kareen has to say next. And it, I'm fine if it's an art book. You could totally talk about art. <laughs> I am going to mention my other special interest, which is the tear terror uh, kind of like play on words. It's also used by BTS in their seminal, seminal song by the rap line. Um, but anyways, if you're doing the drinking game at home, you can absolutely take a drink after that one. All right. So in 2018, a new app appeared on the market promising safe and secure communication. It was called 
a nom. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to giggle a lot during this one because it's really quite, quite bananas to get through. So here we go. So yes, just an app. It appears anon. No one knows where it comes from, but it promises safe and secure kind of like communication. So who needs safe and secure communication? People who do business in the shadows. People who don't want their communications being looked at by, oh, let's say the authorities. And so this app became popular with money launderers, hitmen, people selling drugs, people shipping drugs, people planning murders. <laughs> People talking about murders, people enacting that murders. Because, of course, you don't want to do that in, like, a cute little WhatsApp group. You need something that you know is encrypted. You know something that cannot be hacked by an outside source. You need to make sure that this communication that you're doing all of your red work in is exclusive to the people who need to get it. And so all of this business was done on this app. It's not traceable, it's secure, but there's only one problem with this app. All of these people, all of these criminals using it, love it, except for the one feature that they don't know about. And that is that the app was secretly run by the FBI. I wish I was joking. <laughs> so yeah, within this app that all of these criminals were using because it promised safe and secure communication, there was a backdoor in it that American, Australian, and European authorities could just swoop in on and use as necessary. Yep. So this, I don't even know what to call this. It Like, debacle, but it also worked as was planned and also was probably helpful, but then things start going wrong because, of course, it would. Like, this is this is absolutely bananas. It's all kind of chronicled in a new book coming out by Joseph Cox called Dark Wire, the incredible true story of the largest sting operation ever. I believe it has already been optioned by Netflix to be turned into a series starring, I believe, Jason Bateman, um, because it really is, <laughs> it is really like honestly to, it sounds so outlandish. But as with my other true crime book, I think it's kind of digging into that idea that we give so much of ourselves and so much of our trust to online platforms, to people that we meet online, that we have so much unearned trust and that it takes so little to exploit that trust for whatever nefarious means you might have, whether that is kind of making someone fall in love with you or tracking all of your criminal enterprises and then giving you over to the authorities. So for me, maybe I know, Virginia, sometimes we come up with like themes in our reading. Maybe my themes is the danger of the internet, which again, I cannot believe that no, not one of them was like, hey, I wonder who's running this. Um, don't we all believe that there's a little FBI man in our phone listening to everything that we do and say, hello, uh, Kiff FBI man who's listening to everything that we say. I hope that you found this podcast enjoyable. Yeah, so I'm definitely going to read this, but I think I'm going to spend most of it giggling. Yeah, so Darkwire, look for it on Netflix or at a bookstore near you. Uh, I'm going to pass this over to Sadie. All right, I have another one for the Kif drinking game. And also, I feel like another one for you, Kareen. Every time you hear me mention Kelly Armstrong, you probably get an art book. <laughs> so Kelly Armstrong has written fantasy. She's written urban fantasy. She's written more traditional fantasy. She has written mystery. She has written thriller. She has written horror. She has written YA. She has written kids let. But she has not yet written romance until now. So I am hesitantly excited about Kelly Armstrong's upcoming contemporary romance, Finding Mr. Right. I I honestly don't know. Oh, she's written historical fiction. Not my favorite. Um, so yes. So I am I am going to give her the benefit of the doubt because I do legitimately enjoy her. I would say that she is one of my favorite authors. I have read pretty much everything that she has written. And so I will, of course, read this. And, and I enjoy romance. So we will see kind of how it plays out. And the concept is also a little bit hilarious. So the story revolves around Daphne McFadden. Now, Daphne is an author, and she knows very well 
that as a female author, she does not exactly have all of the benefits of a male author in in the same career. And so to kind of get beyond that, she decides that she's going to submit her next book under a male pseudonym to see if maybe it will make any difference. She's been turned down over and over and over again. But as soon as she submits her book as Zane Remington, it's picked up immediately, which is great. She's finally getting her book published. However, now she has to figure out how she's going to promote her book as Zane Remington when she is very clearly not Zane Remington. So the most logical explanation is to hire an actor to pretend to play Zane Remington. And so she finds Chris Stanton. Now, Chris Stanton is kind of an actor. He's mainly an accountant, but, you know, he he dabbles in acting on the side. And he is not exactly the kind of character that Zane Remington is. Zane Remington is a manly man. Zane Remington lives in the woods and chops firewood on a daily basis and knows how to paddle a canoe. And, well, Chris is more at home balancing books than living in the wilderness. However, he is willing to take on this role. And so he goes with Daphne to her gorgeous remote home in the Yukon, and they go to pretend that he is Zane Remington and kind of plan out how they're going to do this. However, the media starts to descend on them, and Chris has to figure out exactly how he's going to pretend to be this person that he is not in any possible way. And so it kind of explains this book that they're trying to figure this out all while hilariously balancing the terrifying dangers of the wilderness, a massive femme fandom, and a serious crush on Daphne. So this book is very lighthearted, very fun, um, a little bit ridiculous. <laughs> it kind of follows the uh, fourth proximity trope. And yeah, so I'm 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 excited to read it. Like I said, I do enjoy Kelly Armstrong. So I, I will give this one a shot. And, and I'm excited to kind of see how how her foray into more traditional and contemporary romance is. So that again is Finding Mr. Right uh, by Kelly Armstrong comes out June 25th. All right, Virginia, what is your next pick for us? Well, I don't know if this is going to be like one of my favorite books, but it's definitely going to be the longest book that I'm going to read in this year because this is clocking at a, more than a thousand pages. I know, right? What was I doing? And this is published by And Other Stories, which I talk about in a small press month episode. Upon coming out in July, we've got Funeral Rites by Gin Pham Singh Long Kreen Ri. And uh, this is not a book in translation. He did write this in English, but he is an author from India. And given the framing of the story, I think it makes total sense that it has to be this long. This is the story of the Kasi people. They are an ethnic group in Meghalaya, in northeastern India, in Assam, and also in Bangladesh. And in an author interview, he said that he wanted to write about us, Kasis, as a people. I feel a sense of frustration, of helplessness, of uselessness when strangers come here and say whatever they like about us and get away with it. So he decided to tell you the story of my people to clear their wounded name. So Funeral Nights is a story of a group of friends, a group of academics that decide to go to a remote part of the West Kasi Hills to watch this six-day-long funeral ceremony which is going to end with a cremation of an elder who has been preserved in a treehouse for like nine months. And it's going to end with a feast of the dead. But this group got there a little too early, almost a week before the event happened. So now they are stuck in the jungle. And with nothing much to do, they started telling stories and sharing stories around the fire. So kind of, they said, model sort of similar to like, you know, the Arabian Nights kind of story. We get all these anecdotes and stories and songs and poetries and parables and fairy tales and every kind of story that you can think of about their journey into the jungle, about death rituals, about admirable men and women, raconteurs and pranksters, lovers and fools, politicians and con men, drunks and taxi drivers, and just 
anything that you can think of about the Kasi people. I had a preview of the book. And even though, you know, I know there's going to be like a thousand some more pages, but it is almost instantly engrossing because I think the narrator has this kind of very self-deplicating kind of humor in the prose as the author trying to describe to us, you know, about the Cassie people, trying to explain to us about them and started with like just talking about the names and the many, many names that they have of people. And just like, it's really fun to see them kind of reflecting on it and sort of making fun a little bit about it. And it's just this delightful telling. And I think Thanks to the generosity of the offer, it gives us access to a world that is probably not found very frequently in literature. And despite the title, as they said, you know, it's a funeral night. It is really not about death. It is definitely about life in all kind of forms. So I think it's one of those books that is going to be for anyone who loves storytelling, especially oral storytelling, because it reads very much like that. So I am looking for this thousand page book. This is called Funeral Nights. All right, let's head over. I'm going to call on Emma again. Let's head over to Emma. All right. My last book for this week, another surprise to nobody. Kareen, you can do another tick on your, I get to talk about another art book. (laughs) You're getting a lot of today. So my last anticipated book for the next few months is from one of my all-time favorite fictional universes, Avatar The Last Airbender. So that's where your your tick comes from as Emma's talking about Avatar again. This series is very, very near and dear to me. I love that it continues to engage new readers and fans because it's got all of these new spinoff comics. I do not acknowledge any live action adaptation as none of them have been successful at capturing the heart of the original series. I'm looking at you, Netflix. And Avatar has had a slew of really successful kids' comics over the last decade or so, each of them telling an original and unique story either during or after the events of the original series. So those play a huge part in why this series continues to be really popular, especially with new readers today. One of the things I really love about these comics is how readers get to see stories from the perspectives of other characters that maybe they met in the original series, but don't get many of their own stories. We don't really get to hear from their perspectives. Not only are we seeing more about the protagonist, but lots of side characters are really fleshed out and given depth and backstory, which in turn makes these side characters more likable and relatable. So this comic, this new and upcoming comic coming out from Avatar, is an example of that. It focuses on Iroh, who's a fan favorite from the original story. And it also focuses on June, who is a bounty hunter who only makes two kind of quick appearances in the source material, but she leaves a huge impression. So this new comic is called The Bounty Hunter and the Tea Brewer, and it's by Vancouver Local, another local author, and one of my favorite kids comics artists named Faith Aaron Hicks. So in this story, we have Iroh, who's running his acclaimed tea shop called The Jasmine Dragon in Ba Sing Se, the biggest city in the Earth Kingdom. And when Iroh's tea supply suddenly and mysteriously dries up, he goes in search of answers and finds himself captured by a familiar face from his past, the beautiful and ruthless bounty hunter June. Iroh, a former Fire Nation general turned tea maker, must confront parts of his past while June considers her future. All the while, they need to solve the mystery of what happened to the missing tea. So I'm really excited for this comic. As all of you guys know, I'm a huge, huge Avatar fan. And the new Avatar comics are written in consultation with the original creators of the show. So they're authentic and true to the source material while also giving readers new insight into characters and into a world that they already love. I was hoping that this book would be out by the time we did our tea episode, but alas, we need to wait until August to read this latest installment of the Avatar series. So if you're into kids comics like I am, or if you're a fan of Avatar, or if you're interested in fantasy and adventure graphic novels with really rich world building and really lovable characters, all things that I love, then I would absolutely check out The Bounty Hunter and The Tea Brewer, which is coming out in August. So we're passing on to (laughs) Kareen. I say that confidently. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to be like very honest in that my number one book it isn't actually a book that I'm looking forward to reading at all. It is definitely number one on my most anticipated, but I am not looking forward to reading it. Honestly, it's really not my thing. I read the description of it and I was like, oh, this is very much a Virginia book and very much not a Korean book. But 
for reasons that will become very evident, it is my number one pick. Virginia's nodding because I think she already knows what this book is. I believe that you texted me when it was announced, but of course I follow him on Twitter, so like we're friends, obviously. I am very, very, very happy for this author to be publishing his own work. He primarily and has only worked as a translator of Korean fiction into English. He is my man, my man, Anton Herr, who I read every single thing that he has translated. I think he is an amazing translator. I think he picks really wonderful stories to translate. I mean, there's a wealth of literature out there and a dizzying amount of languages that never makes its way into English. And I really appreciate the work that Anton does to kind of bring Korean books and literature into the English language market. Um, the work of him and other translators really, really helps us kind of see the, the depth of literature that we miss often. And so he often takes books by women authors, queer authors, and translates them into English so that we, we have access to those stories and to those voices. But this time he is publishing his own book. It is has been a busy year for him. It will be a busy year for him. To date in 2024, his translations of Your Utopia has come out, which I know was greatly anticipated by all library staff. Magical Girl Returns came out in April. He's also going to be, his translations of I Want to Die But I Still Want to Eat Tokbuki is coming out in August. The Blood of Old Kings is coming out in October. Yeah, he's a busy guy. And somehow in the middle of this, he wrote his own book. He's, he's one of my literary heroes. And so even though the subject matter does not interest me in the slightest, and I actually finished the description of the book and went, oh. did I pre-order it? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Am I going to read it? Yeah. Am I going to enjoy it? I don't know, but it's not going to be his fault. Okay, I have to have this up because I read through the description at least five times and it just won't stay in my head because it's something my brain doesn't want to hear. So it's been compared to Ishiguro's Clara and the Sun and Emily St. John Mandel's Sea of Tranquility. And it's asking the question... What does it mean to be human in a world where technology is quickly catching up to biology? I know, Virginia, you care. Okay. 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 So it's kind of like the near future. Got a lot of technology and it's like nanites, tiny robots or android cells that have like, they're curing cancer. They they can take care of everything. Um, they go into your cells and they kind of rebuild them as tiny little monsters. Or sorry robots, maybe they're monsters, undecided. That's what the book is asking. But anyone who kind of gets this treatment from these little robots becomes kind of virtually immortal because they're mostly robots or are they? So I think our main character is Young Hoon, who is a literary researcher who is teaching an AI how to understand poetry. And he kind of like names this machine Panit, which means beloved in honor of his husband. Young Hoon has received this nanotherapy and then he mysteriously vanishes into thin air and then just as suddenly reappears. But what happened to him and is what returned actually him or is it robot? Mm -hmm. And then we have Dr. Biko, the scientist who holds the patent on the nanotherapy technology, learns about Panit, this kind of like poetry robot. Oh gosh, here we go. Okay. And then he transfers its consciousness from the machine into an android body that gives it freedom and life so it can like walk around and do poetry. And then nanohumans are thriving and then they start to replicate as this always happens. This is why we should stop our robots now. And then we're faced with an existential crossroads. So, according to the blurb, it's exploring the nature of intelligence, the unexpected consequence of progress, the meaning of personhood in life, and what we really have to fear from technology, everything, that's my editorializing, and the future. It is going to be gorgeous and thought-provoking and is going to challenge the notion of what makes us human and how love survives even at the end of that humanity. So, Virginia, you're smiling because this is very much up your alley of like, oh, no, we're all replaced by robots and it's really bad and it's going to be really glum and it's going to be like, oh, what's the point of humanity? What's the point of this? What's the point of that? 
But because it's in the hands of Anton Her, I am willing to give this a shot. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to read it. I'm going to review it. It's going to go on my staff picks, even though I feel like the actual reading of this is going to be deeply painful to me. So it is my number one pick. It is Toward Eternity by Anton Her, and I suggest you all read it, even if you're not going to enjoy it. Emma? No, Emma just talked. It's Sadie. It's only Sadie. Sadie all the time. For my final pick, I feel like as a series reader, I always have at least one sequel that makes its appearance on my most anticipated list. And this is a third book of a series that I have been waiting for since the second book came out in 2019. And I am very, very excited to say that it is finally coming out. Expected publication June 25th. There has been a bit of disagreement on uh, the podcast about this book and about this series, but I remain firm in my love for this series. Uh, when I first read uh, the very first book, I was just brought into the world and I never want to leave it ever again. And so the series itself is A Legacy of Orisha by Tomi Adeyemi. And the first book, Children of Blood and Bone, came out in 2018. And the newest book, Children of Anguish and Anarchy is finally, finally coming out, and I am so excited. I won't go into a huge amount of detail about the third book itself, just in case people have not read the first two and are interested in it, but I will tell you a little bit about the series and about how the series starts. So it follows uh, Zeli Adebola. Zeli still has memories of when Orisha was filled with magic. Burners would ignite flames, titers would beckon the waves, and Zeli's reaper mother summoned souls. But then everything changed the night that magic disappeared. The king gave an order, the magi were killed, and Zeli was left without a mother. But now there's a chance to bring magic back and to fight against the monarchy. And so Zeli, with the help of a rogue princess, is on a journey to outrun the crown prince and figure out how they can bring magic back into the world. And so the first and second book revolve around this journey to bring magic back into the world. There was some debate on whether or not some of the more romantic elements of this book were slightly misplaced, which I can give, I give you that. Maybe running away from your enemies is not the perfect time to share a kiss, but maybe it is. Maybe it is. Find joy when you can. So the third book starts just after the big battle takes place in the last book. I'll read just a little bit, but I don't want to give too much away. It says, new allies rise, the blood moon nears, and Zeli faces her final enemy, the king who hunts her heart. And so this story has moved Zeli into an unknown land. She's been kidnapped uh, along with her friends, and she's brought to a land across the sea that she doesn't know anything about. And she meets an enemy there that she also doesn't know anything about and doesn't know why she has been brought to this land by him. So I'm really excited to kind of see where this story goes. I think that Adeyemi could have ended the series just as a duology. I think that the story kind of wrapped up in the second book, and then she sort of put this little bit on the end that opened it up for a trilogy. And so I'm really excited to kind of see where the story goes. The series is really great. It's based and inspired by uh, Yoruba culture from Western Africa. And so it talks a lot about and brings in a lot of the kind of the magic of that culture and the Orisha gods and all of kind of that history and that uh, mythology, which I, I am so fascinated by. So I'm excited to kind of see how the story goes and uh, what happens to Zeli and and if maybe there is going to be a fourth book. I don't know if I want to wait another five years for it, but I'm I'm interested to know if if it's kind of opened up again for a fourth book at the end. So that is the third book in the legacy of Arisha, The Children of Anguish and Anarchy coming out June 25th. I am very excited. All right, Virginia, what is your last book? I'm so glad that the sequel is finally coming out. You know, I'm looking at you, uh, Iron Widow, like, when are you coming out the next book? Um, it's been in our catalog forever and ever. But anyway, um, yeah, it's always nice to have, have the sequels. I'm actually kind of bummed that um, Miss Corrine is not here because this book is right up her alley, not at all. Picture a little boy. He just got hold of the latest issue of his favorite comic. And he's so super excited. He's invited his friends to come and share and read together. And he's supposed to wait, but he just 
couldn't wait anymore. So he stopped. Well, oh, maybe I'll just read one page. But then, of course, before you know it, he just keep reading and reading. And he's almost done by the time his friend arrives. It's okay. I haven't read the last story yet. Let's read it together. And so they get into that blanket fort, they turn on their flashlight, and they read aloud to each other. They do all the sound effects, they mime all the actions, and they have a great time sharing this wonderful comic book. Now, substitute the two little boys with two grown men. And instead of a comic book, picture them holding this short story collection that they are so super excited about. And one of them read all the stories in one night, except one. And so he invited this friend to come over to read together this only story that they haven't read. It's all made up, of course, but that is how I picture the scene when I learn about how amazing and how excited two literary giants are when they discover their fellow Argentinian author's work. The two literary giants I'm talking about, Jorge Luis Borges and Adolfo Bio Caceles, and they got the hold of author and help Bonomini's short story collection called The Novices of Learner, which in May, thanks to Transit Book and translator Jordan Landsman, we too have a chance to experience the wonderful work of Bonomini, known as one of the most overlooked authors from Argentina. Transit Books, of course, brought us the last Nobel Prize winner, John Fosse, and this is Bonomini's first English debut. It has 16 stories, which include the novella, the title of the book, uh, The Novices of a Learner. And that story is about Ramon Beltra, who is a scholar and not doing much, but one day got a letter in the mail. And this letter is an invitation from the University of Lerner in Switzerland, a very fancy university. And they are offering him a six-month fellowship or pay for. Now, Beltra doesn't really know where this come from. It's not like he applied for it or anything like that. He doesn't even know why they know about him. He's not famous or anything. But for whatever reason, they just seem very differential in the letter. They just seem like they really want him to join this project. So he's like, sure, I'll do it. It's paid for anyway. And so he started to fill out all the paperwork that he needs to send before he show up. And the paperwork are kind of weird because they're all forms asking for a lot of photos of him and his body and a lot of measurements. They, for some reason, need very, very detailed measurements of him. When finally he got everything finalized, everything is ready, he travels by train to the university. And he was met at the station by one of his fellow students, somebody who's also joining this fellowship. But something is not quite right. Because this novice looks exactly like Beltra. In fact, when he got to the university, he realized that all the 23 people that have been invited to this project all look exactly like him. What is happening? When Caceres wrote to Bodomini about his experience reading this book. He described the story as with much wisdom, everything is spot on from the pleasantly calm tone to the description and ambience of the setting. Like they just love his work so much. And it's weird that like nobody really have heard of him except all his contemporaries that really, really love his work. I got to read this already and some of those stories are totally right up my alley. They are strange, they are surreal, they are absurd. And some some of them took pretty dark turns, but I can see why it will appeal to Borges, it will appeal to Caceres. Like that just seems like um, for readers who love their work, I think you should really check this out because I think you would totally enjoy this. So yeah, that's my last book. Super, super excited about that. And I hope you will also find someone who will appreciate them as much so that you can share reading out loud this book with them together. So this is The Novices of Learner and it's by Angel Bonamini, translated by Jordan Lansman. All right, so that is all for today. I know for me at least, it was really hard to pick 
five books because there were just so many, so many great books coming out. So um, I'm sure there's lots more. As Emma pointed out, a lot of books are already on order on our catalog. So please go and put them on hold. We can wait to hear what you think about some of the books that we have talked about. And also, if you have books that you are looking forward to reading, please do share in the comments. So thank you again for joining us for another episode of Keep It Fictional, and we will see you next time. Thank you for listening. If you like our show, please tell a fellow book lover about it. You can find a list of all the books we discussed in our show notes. Join us next week for another fun book chat. Until then, keep it fictional. Mm-hmm.